all for tuning in today. Um, this, of course, is our July virtual forum. So hopefully you're in the right place. Um, just we're going to go over some quick slides here before we hop into our presentation. Um, so if you're not familiar with us, um, this presentation is hosted by partners of Scott County Watersheds. We are a nonprofit organization um, based in Scott County, Iowa, and we are dedicated to improving the health and stewardship of the watersheds within our area. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is through educational forums like this one. Um, so a few things as we get started here, this presentation um, is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel after today. So I give it about a week and it'll be up. Um, so if you ever want to refer back to it, that information is available. Any questions you have throughout the presentation, um, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom there. Um, that's this one here, the two little bubbles, and we will refer to them there. If you have any questions um, about technical issues, um, something, you know, you can't see the picture, you can't hear the video, whatever it is, please use the chat feature and send that chat to our webinar facilitator, ATAC, and we can help you out there. So chat for technical questions, Q&A box for um, topic related questions. So I do have to plug, you know, some partners things in here. As I mentioned, um, we're a nonprofit. We do a lot to um, really promote and improve um, and get people involved in the watershed. So we have a couple different ways that we're doing that. We have some, um, some additional forums coming up. We have um, kind of a, a specialty forum in two weeks. Um, and that's going to be with Augustana College faculty. And then in a month, we have an in-person forum. So that one should be pretty exciting. Um, we also have some cleanup scheduled and all of this can be found on our website. Um, so more information there and how to register as well. Of course, we can't do any of this with all our partners. So we're incredibly appreciative of the people who help us um, help our watershed. So, you know, there's some representatives um, in our in our crowd, our virtual crowd here today. So thank you and thank you to the rest of our partners um, for all you do to help us. And if you want to be a partner of Partners of Scott County Watersheds, uh, we have some different options. So whether you're at an organizational level or you yourself as an individual want to get more involved, we have ways. Um, and again, all of that is available on our website. And we would be happy to answer any questions if you do have those. With that, I think I'm going to go ahead and turn it over um, to the woman of the hour. We got Jen Kurth here from Iowa DNR, and um, she's the expert on herself. So I'll let her introduce um, and start telling us what the people want to hear all about muscles. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, let's see. There we go. You see that all right? Okay. Well, thank you for having me. I am, whoops, I am Jen Kurth. I am a biologist with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. I've been in this position for about 15 and a half years now. Um, I do a lot of different things, but the, the muscles are kind of, that's, that's my real passion project. So um, I always say you can always get me to talk about muscles. The hard part's getting me to stop. So I think I've left enough time in the presentation for questions, so, so um, please make sure to um, keep those in mind because I'm always happy to ask, answer questions. So talking about freshwater mussels. So why are mussels important? Um, well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, um, you can see here that there's a lot of algae and things growing on the shells themselves. So um, these are actually snails here on the, on the left hand side uh, that are actually grazing on the algae growing on the shells of the mussels, kind of like cows in a pasture. So they're providing habitat for other animals. Um, they actually uh, dig into the substrate of the, the, the bottom of the river or the stream or the lake that they're in. And um, studies at the University of Iowa have actually shown that dense mussel beds can actually um, stabilize the river bottom and um, even change the, the flow of the water um, at the river bottom. So they're stabilizing the substrate, they're providing habitat, 
um, for other creatures. And then oftentimes you'll find, uh, if you find shells out in the wild, um, crayfish like to use them for shelters. Uh, you'll find eggs of various uh, invertebrates that have been laid in there. Um, and they just provide habitat even once they're, they're no longer alive. But their main function, I like to call them Mother Nature's water filtration system. So um, this is a, an example of how much clearer the water can get. These, this is after an hour um, of having these three mussels in this tank. So the tank on the right is what the water looked like to begin with, and the tank on the left is how much those three mussels have already cleared up the water just by filter, filtering it um, in that hour that they've had them in there. So they take um, the water in through their in-current siphon and they'll sort out whatever they can eat um, and that will get in, eat, uh, eaten obviously. And then whatever they can't digest, like say sediment particles or other um, things that actually gets bound up in mucus and deposited on the river bottom for other scavengers to eat. So basically they're taking the water in through their system, they're filtering it and then they, Put, um, return it to the system through their ex-current siphon um, a whole lot cleaner than it used to be. So uh, one of the big questions I get is, can you eat them? Um, I don't know really why you would want to, but technically the Native Americans did use them as a food resource. Uh, I do not recommend it now because obviously they're filtering out all sorts of stuff that we have put into the water and uh, you're probably gonna get very, very sick. Plus, unlike the, the mussels that you would get in a seafood restaurant, which come from the ocean, um, our mussels are largely foot, just a giant foot, and they can move around a lot, so they're very tough and chewy. So, what are the big threats to freshwater mussels here in Iowa? Well, the biggest one here in Iowa is habitat loss. Um, if you think about it, we've drastically altered the, the, uh, the landscape in Iowa over the last hundred and 70 years or so um, in, you know, we put a lot of silt into the river systems and the streams and the lakes. Um, and mussels tend to prefer a nice mixed substrate of sand and gravel and rock. Um, there aren't very many mussels that do very well in silt and it's not of stable substrate. So even if they're, if, if they can survive in that sandy or, or real silty substrate, you know, if you get a big pulse of um, like a flood water coming through that, all that substrate that's really fine gets swept along with them, along with the mussels. Um, and then we've also done a lot of uh, channelization and dredging of our streams and, and river systems. Um, in addition to uh, doing tile drainage, um, I was helping ID some mussels found in a Native American shell midden for a, an archaeology student at the University of Iowa. And based on the species composition, um, it was clear that the, that the Iowa River at Iowa City was a much smaller river back when these, these mussels were being found. So just by adding all that extra water that comes off the land faster, we've increased the size of the river. We've straightened them, which means the, the water can move much faster. And then we've also put in a lot of dams um, over the last 170 years. And um, dams can actually block the passage of their fish hosts, which I'll go over here in a, a little bit. Um, and now we're actually looking at removing a lot of these dams because a lot of them are more than 100 years old and are failing or no longer serve the purpose for what, they're, what they were designed for and have become a ha hazard for um, recreation on, on the rivers. And uh, you have to really think about how you remove a dam to minimize the impact to the mussels because the mussels that live below the dam, if you just take the dam out, any silt that um, piled up behind the dam um, can actually then just come out in a big pulse and bury mussels downstream. And then you can also have mussels that might be in the impoundment upstream that get dewatered if you don't do this mindfully. Um, they are also uh, very vulnerable to certain types of pollution. In aquatic toxicology tests, they found that the, um, the larval and juvenile forms of freshwater mussels are the most sensitive to ammonia pollution of any organism they've tested. Um, so if we have a, an ammonia spill or a manure spill, 
Um, the adults can actually literally clam up and ride it out on the, you know sort of the water they have inside of them, but you're going to lose um, several year classes of the very young ones, and if that happens often enough, you're not going to get a, re a, a viable population. They'll just end up being a population of senior citizens that can no longer reproduce and the muscles could die out. Um, the other thing they're very sensitive to are some of the metals um, they've found as well. Thankfully, not so much to some of the herbicides and pesticides that we uh, have been using. And then the last uh, threat are exotic species or introduced species, invasive species. Um, probably the one you've heard the most about is the zebra mussel. Um, they can actually attach to any hard surface and including our native species. So they can prevent them from adequately feeding, from being able to burrow into the substrate to overwinter, from reproducing. So they're the biggest threat. Um, the Asian clam, is simply a competitor for food resources, um, but they're not as big of a threat as the zebra mussels. And then the newest one is the black carp. Um, it's a relative of the grass carp and the silver carp that you may have heard about, the ones that like to jump out into people's motorboats on the Mississippi. Um, the black carp was introduced in, uh, was brought in to uh, handle, to help clean fish ponds down in the southern part of the Mississippi River Basin. Um, of course, they said it was not going to escape and, oh, if it does, it's, it's triploid, it can't reproduce. Um, well, big shocker, it, um, it escaped and uh, we have evidence that they are reproducing and they're moving up the, the Mississippi River to our neck of the woods. And the thing with the black carp, unlike the grass and silver carp, black carp actually eat mussels. Um, so they're going to be eating our native species and there's no known predator. So that's another big newly emerging threat. So, like I said earlier, mussels are largely just a huge foot. And you can see these guys here have their feet out. It's kind of a, a spade shaped foot. Um, and they can use that to both move horizontal or vertically in the substrate to, to move up and down, um, depending on the season for, for winter or or spring or summer, and then they can also use it to move vertically or horizontally in the substrate um, to move around to find, you know, if the water levels drop or something like that. Um, but because they're mostly foot, there really is not much of a brain. They have no eyes. So oftentimes you'll see in, in times of low flow and droughts, you'll see trails like this where they're trying to get to deeper water. Now, if there's enough of a slope, on the river bottom, they can follow a temperature gradient to do that, but in those broad, flat, shallow sandbar areas, um, oftentimes you'll see lines like this where they're trying to get deeper water, um, but they really have no idea where to go. And usually what it ends up happening is either they somehow make it and they survive, um, they die of exposure, or they die of predation by raccoons and muskrats. So they have kind of a unique life cycle in that they actually need to attach to a fish host as part of their life cycle. So just like us, they have male and female. So the male releases his sperm into the water column, floats downstream to the female of the appropriate species, hopefully. Um, and then they go in through the in-current siphon and the eggs are fertilized and actually she breeds them in special chambers on her gills called marsupia until they reach their larval form. Which, is, which are called glochidia. There's two main types of glochidia. There's the ones you can see there that have the wicked hooks on them, and they can attach to the fins as well as the gills of a, of a fish host. And then the other ones that look kind of like double toilet seat lids, they can only attach to the, the gills of the fish host. So um, up in the upper left, you can see a, 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 a picture of what it looks like to have the uh, glochidia attached to the gills of the fish host. So once they attach, they form a tissue pocket around them um, and they do get some nutrients from the fish host, so they are considered um, mildly parasitic. But the amount of infestation in the, um, in the wild does not harm the fish. And actually there's evidence that shows that after the fish has been a host a few times, it develops an immunity. Um, and so if at that point, the glochidia were to attach, um, the fish's immune system would attack them and it would kill them and they, they wouldn't um, survive. 
But while they're attached to their fish host, they actually transform from their larval form into their juvenile form. So if you look at the, you know, the pictures of the, of the glochidia, it really, all they are are two halves of the shell and the, the muscles, M-U-S-C-L-E-S, -E that allow them to open and shut the shell. While they're attached to the fish host, you can see here on the lower um, left, they actually, is when they develop their foot and they start growing um, new shell around the, the uh, glochidial shell. So once they reach that juvenile stage, then they drop off of the fish and hopefully land in good habitat where then they can um, continue the cycle. So when they first drop off of the fish, they actually have this long clear thread here called a bissel thread that they use to attach to the substrate until they're big enough um, and strong enough for their foot to dig them in and hold onto the substrate. And this is one of the things that differentiates them from um, as mussels versus clams. Um, just like the, the zebra mussel that attaches as an adult to something hard, blue mussels, the ones you get in restaurants, they do that in the ocean as well. Um, ours only have this bissel thread for the first year or two. Um, so you can see this is my hand. And uh, so the, the mussel on the bottom that still has its bissel thread, that one dropped off of its fish host that summer. And then the one that's above it, that's a little bit bigger, that one um, is about a year older. So it no longer has its bristle thread. It, it's, it's strong enough to dig in and hold on. So some of the, the mussels, especially the ones that have the hooks, can attach to pretty much any fish that swims by and transform into their juvenile forms. But other species are very host specific. And so they've developed some really cool strategies to make sure that the glaucidia get onto the right fish host. Because if they these host specific ones, if they attach to the wrong type of fish, um, they do not transform, they just die. So the first host attraction strategy are called conglutinates, which is just a fancy pet name for a mucus packet. Um, so if you see the little bumps alongside um, in the upper left picture, those little black dots, those are all of the glochidia. It's all packaged into a little little package. And the, the female actually spits that out onto the river bottom where a fish swimming around that maybe likes to eat insect larvae, which is what these are supposed to mimic, comes along, sees it, thinks he's getting a tasty treat for lunch, bites into it, it breaks open. Now, a lot of them do get eaten, but some of them will actually pass out over the gills um, with the water that the fish is taken in and they can attach. Um, so all of the things on these fancy looking ones that have that look like eye spots and tentacles and everything like that, that's all just unfertilized eggs. Um, some of them are real fancy like that and they look like they mimic insect larvae. Um, some of them are very unfancy and they kind of look like coconut shavings to me, I don't know. Um, but apparently some fish still think they look tasty. So, but they're all pretty small. You can see the scale there with the penny. So they're not super large. Um, the next type of host attraction strategy is a super conglutinate. So here you have the female muscle and attached to it by a long clear thread is the super conglutinate that's probably about two inches, whoops, two inches long. And it waves in the current and she's basically going fishing. So you can see that it has, an, has eye spots and a lateral line stripe to look like a fish. That one's been munched on. So obviously it's been quite successful. So basically she's going fishing for her fish host. So this one is obviously trying to track the fish that likes to eat other fish. Um, the other strat uh, strategy <laughs> is um, mantle lures. Now the mantle is this uh, layer of tissue on either side of the muscle here. Um, it's actually what secretes the shell material, but some species um, have developed the ability to, they've been, grown the mantle out so that it can extrude from um, the shell. <coughs> Excuse me. And they use this to attract the fish host. Now this one's a very ba basic mantle lure. It doesn't really look like much of anything. Um, these things that in here that look like teeth, those are actually the marsupia where the Galchidia are held. Um, this one's unique in that the female black sand shell actually comes out of the river and lays on the river bottom to attract her fish host. 
There we go. So you can see off to the right there, there's been a bite taken out, so obviously it works. I like to think she's just sort of laying there saying, hey, you fishies, come check this out. Um, so this one, she like these guys like to use uh, smallmouth bass, um, walleye, some of the sunfish um, as fish hosts. So this one's a real primitive mantle lure. Um, some are more sophisticated, like this one is meant to mimic a little minnow. You can see it's got an eye spot and tail fin, and in this case, the, the gray blobs that are sticking out in the middle there, that's the marsupium. So obviously this one is trying to attract um, fish that like to eat little fish. Um, and it's very effective because I was swimming in the Iowa River uh, snorkeling and it was very good visibility and um, real soft, it was kind of in a, a a backflow area, so it was real soft sand substrate, and I, swim, I was swimming up and there was this little fish on the bottom of the river, and you know, I'm used to seeing fish, but this one didn't scare away as I got closer, and I realized that the female was completely under the substrate, and all that she had above it was the little mineral mantle lure, so um, obviously if I was a fish, I would have been fooled into thinking that that was um, dinner. Now sometimes the, the mantle gets eaten along with uh, the the, uh, getting the Gulkidia in there, bursting the marsupium, um, and that can actually regrow. So that one was meant to look like a fish. This one is meant to look like a crayfish, and it, so it has kind of a tail and then the little tentacles and the fake legs, and it does even does a backward scattering motion, like kind of a skittering motion, kind of like crayfish like to do. So we don't actually have this species here in Iowa, but it's a wicked cool video. So I just wanted to show the options that they have out there for post attraction. So those are attraction behaviors. The last one is um, an actual host capture. So instead of going fishing for her fish host, she actually goes trapping. So this is the snuff box. It's a species that we used to have here in Iowa, but we don't anymore, sadly. It uses a species of fish as host called northern log perch. Now, northern log perch uh, feed by turning over rocks and eating what lives under there. So they have a real thick enforced skull um, that allows them to do that. So here comes our unsuspecting fish. So she's got extra, extra little teeth on either side of her shell that allow her to um, grab on and hold on to the fish host. And she actually then squirts the fish, the Gulkidia, into the fish's mouth. And then when she's done, she'll let him swim away and he'll tell his friends what a horrible day he's been having. Now, if this was any other species of fish that didn't have that thicker skull, um, the head would be crushed and, and the babies wouldn't, wouldn't transform. So pretty cool strategies when you consider they really don't have a brain or any eyes and they've evolved that. So before um, European settlement, uh, like I said, Native Americans did use them as a food source. Um, but they also used their shells for tools and for decoration, and they would actually grind up the shell material and mix it with clay to make their pottery stronger. Once the Europeans got here, um, initially they were just inter interested in the mussels for the freshwater pearls that um, they could produce. Uh, so they were actually even starting to harvest them um, in the mid-1800s uh, looking for freshwater pearls. But in 1889, a German immigrant by the name of Johann Buchler uh, arrived from, from Germany in uh, Muscatine. He had had a button factory over in Europe and they'd kind of overfished all of their mussels in their rivers and streams. So they were, were running out of, of, of mussels they could use, but they got here and they saw the Mississippi and all the rivers in Iowa and they thought, oh, wow, look at all these mussels. So he opened the first button factory in Muscatine in 1889. And um, within 10 years, Muscatine was known as the button capital of the world. So these guys are standing on piles of shells. So if you figure that this guy here in the middle is like maybe six feet tall, it's like maybe a 10, 12 foot pile of shell. And I found a description in an old book that was discussing, um, one guy was saying that they were taking every muscle they could find, whether or not it was really usable um, for what they were looking for, just so that their competitor couldn't find them. So the time period of uh, 1912 to 1914, over si almost 700 tons of shells were taken from Iowa interior rivers. This is not including the Mississippi River. 
Um, so they're just massively over harvesting these, uh, these species and we've seen how complex their life cycle is. And a lot of the um, thicker shelled species, they, uh, they can live to be 50 to 80 years old. So they have a real slow growth period and, and it's a real long uh, lifespan. So they were harvesting these species at a much higher rate than could be sustained. So basically um, by the 1930s, um, cheaper shells were che cheaper buttons were coming in from uh, Asia, and the and the the um, industry really collapsed here in Iowa. Then in the 1950s, they discovered that freshwater mussel shell makes really good nuclei for cultured pearls. So now what they do is they harvest harvest the shells, they drill balls out of them rather than the little mussel uh, shell uh, button blanks. And they ship the, the balls of shell over to Asia, where it's inserted into the marine pearl oyster in order to make a cultured pearl. And because it's the same material, basically, um, the, the layers that the pearl oyster puts on there ad adhere really well to the shell. They had tried all sorts of things, wood, glass, um, metal kind of things. But now, so here you can see a cultured pearl that's been cut open. The, uh, you know, 95% of any cultured pearl now is actually a freshwater mussel shell. So it just has a real thin layer of the marine pearl oyster nacre um, attached to it to make it a pearl. So here in Iowa, we had about 50 species of freshwater mussels. We've got seven species that are no longer found in Iowa at all. Um, they're extirpated. Um, they're not completely extinct because they're found in other other states, but they're just gone completely from Iowa. We have another five species that we don't find in our inland rivers anymore. They're only found in the Mississippi River. Um, we have five federally listed species here in Iowa, but two of those uh, we no longer have. They're, they're um, extirpated in Iowa. And then we have seven endangered and six listed as threatened by the state of Iowa here. So the two that are extirpated, um, this is the snuff box. That's the one that does the, the um, she actually captures her fish host, the northern long perch. So we used to have that here in Iowa. Um, surrounding states still have it too. Um, they've got them up in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois, but we do not have them here in Iowa anymore. Um, not really sure why we do still have northern log perch. So I'm hopeful that we might find a surprise population of them, but you never know. Um, the fat pocketbook is one that was only found in the Mississippi to begin with, and that is no longer found in the Mississippi River in the Iowa section. So that is extirpated as well. And we do have three federally endangered species um, still here in Iowa. Um, two of them, the spectacle case and the sheep nose, are only found in the Mississippi River now. We no longer have them in inland rivers. And the Higgins eye curly mussel was also only in the Mississippi, but it has been successfully reintroduced into the Iowa River below uh, Coralville Dam and into the Wapsipinicon um, between Central City and Anamosa. <coughs> Excuse me. Starting in the early 2000s, they started releasing um, fish that had been infested with the glochidia of the Higgins eye pearly mussel into the Iowa, the Wapsie, and the Cedar River downstream of Cedar Falls. Um, and it worked in the Iowa and the Wapsie Pinnacan. We're actually going back this summer just to see if there is, you know, by some miracle, some Kurt Higgins eye in the Cedar, but that um, really didn't seem to take there as well. Um, and uh, it, you know, obviously it takes a while for the mussels to get big enough to actually find to see if this is working. Um, but they, they did eventually find adult Higgins eyes in um, both the Iowa and the Wapsipinicon. And then they stopped stocking for a while. And we went back and actually found young mussels of Higgins eye in both the Iowa and the Wapsipinicon. So they are actually not only the ones that you know were released and, and grew up there, they're not only just thriving, they're actually reproducing as well. So we consider that a successful reintroduction. Um, you guys might know about these guys, uh, these three mussel species because of the I-75 
or sorry, I-74 bridge project. Um, they were the reason that they had to do all the muscle moves was because where the where they wanted to put that bridge in um, was the it was like the hotbed of for mussels and so they had to move them all the way out of the way because they are all federally endangered species. So Iowa um, has uh, also has an endangered species list. Um, the three that we just talked about, the slipper, or sorry, spectacle case, the Higgins eye, pearly mussel, and the sheep nose are all listed by the state of Iowa as endangered as well as being federally endangered. But we have um, four species that we consider endangered here in Iowa, but they're not federally listed. Um, one of them, the slipper shell, was thought to be extirpated in Iowa, and uh, I found some. So it was a really awesome day to find that they are not extirpated. They're just very, very rare. So they, they are actually still here in Iowa, and I'm hoping someday that I can do the same thing with the snuff box and some of the other species. So the slipper shell, the pistol grip, the round pig toe, and the yellow sand shell are all considered endangered by the state of Iowa. Now, some species actually have male and female shell forms. And so you can see that here with the yellow sand shell. Um, the females tend to be a little more squared off um, in the siphon end. That is, that's kind of where the marsupium are. Uh, so it allows them a little more room to brood the babies on. And then the males tend to be a little bit more pointed. So you'll see that again in some of the other species that we talked about. So um, these are actually all found in, in, in interior rivers um, as well as the Mississippi, except for the slipper shell. That's a small stream species. So uh, pistol grip is very interesting. For the most part, you only find them in the lower parts of the bigger rivers downstream of the first dam. Um, the exception to that rule, as I discovered, was that we actually have them in the North Raccoon. So they are actually above the first dam, a couple of dams actually on the, on the Des Moines River. Um, so a lot of our threatened species are smaller stream species. And partly I think that's just because when they were going out and doing a lot of these surveys, they, they tended to focus on the larger rivers. So a lot of the ones, um, I, I focused on a lot of the smaller streams and, and uh, headwaters of our bigger rivers. And um, so they're not maybe quite as threatened as we thought they were, but they are very much separated um, because they are smaller stream species. So the creek heel splitter, the creeper, and then the cylindrical paper shell or cylinder, and the ellipse um, all tend to be smaller stream species. Um, and the, the creeper is actually fairly widespread throughout Iowa, but it's just not very common where it's found. Um, the butterfly, you can see why it's named the butterfly. It kind of looks like butterfly wings when you spread the shell out there. That one is primarily found in the Mississippi River, but we do have it in the lower parts of like the Iowa River and the upper Iowa and, and some of the ones that are connected to the Mississippi. That tends to be more of a big river species. Um, the purple warty back is thought to be extirpated in Iowa. Um, and then I found this shell with tissue still in it, um, just starting to smell of decomposition in, in the lower part of the Skunk River. And um, we're hoping that there might still be a population of purple warty back down there, um, which would be awesome. These guys sort of have a soft spot for me because when I was first starting out as an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota, I was doing fish house studies and um, purple warty back and the pistol grip were the two species I started out with. So you can see it's got its name because it's got sort of pimples on its back, warts, and then on the inside, the, the nacre, the mother of pearl, um, is this lovely purple color. Now sometimes you can have it like purple and white like this one, this one sometimes it's all purple. Um, so that's where it gets its name from. So we're actually going to go out this summer, hopefully, and uh, see if we can maybe find some purple warty back living in the Lower Skunk River, which would be very exciting. So most of what we know about the mussels now comes from a statewide survey that I did from 2011 to 2014. I actually got funding from the EPA to do the survey because as far as I know, we are the only state 
in the US that actually has segments of rivers and streams listed as impaired for mussel declines. Um, so we actually got funding to go out and do some new mussel surveys and I tried to get as much coverage as I could. Um, it, was, it was tough work, you know, getting paid to go out and play in the water for seven summers. But, you know, I, I struggled through it. So it was a lot of fun. Um, and then using that data that I had, I developed um, an index for freshwater mussels in Iowa, which is basically like a score, a grade for the segments. And uh, so all the, the segments that are, are purple are considered excellent for mussel, and then good, fair, and poor. And this isn't looking at, you know, comparing it to what they would have been pre-Europeans, because in that case, they'd all probably get uh, rate as fair or poor. This is con kind of considered, you know, how it is with what we have left now. So it might be areas that we need to focus on for, for preservation or areas that we could focus on for reintroduction, um, that kind of thing. So how do we find mussels? Well, obviously, if it's a drought year, you just go out and you follow the trails and hope there's a mussel at the end. And oftentimes, it just sort of feels like in those cases, you're doing more of a mussel rescue than an actual survey. Um, and uh, otherwise, um, you get in, and if it's the visibility is good enough, use a mask and snorkel, or you use scuba gear, depending on the depth of water. You get in, and you look for the mussels that way. But oftentimes, it's just being in there on your hands and knees and squishing around in the substrate and pulling out anything that feels like a mussel. Um, but it's honestly, even doing that, it's still a lot of fun, especially on these really hot days like today because you're in the water and you don't, you just, you, it's, you don't feel the hot, the heat. So it's a really a lot of fun. Um, one thing that we can do, especially, and this is a component of my um, muscle biotic index, is aging the muscle. So just like, kind of like a tree that adds rings um, each year, muscles will also add rings. Um, basically, they have the big growth periods, and then the darker lines are their sort of winter senescence periods. <coughs> and you can usually count the lines up until about the age of seven or eight. And then after that point, the muscle really grows so slowly that the only way to age it further is to actually slice the shell and do a thin microsection and look under a microscope. But for indicating if you have recruitment to your population, it's a good way to look. Because you want to know if your population is just a bunch of senior citizens that are going to die out and you're not going to have a population there in, in you know, 10 years, or are they actually recruiting young muscles to the, to the um, population as well. And it really varies. You can't just go by size. Because you can see here, this, this one here on the, the very left, um, the oldest part of the shell is up at the, at the, you know, the very top. And so you can see that it didn't really have a couple of good, really good first couple of years. It didn't grow very much, especially that, uh, that second year there. Whereas something like these, these ones down here in the bottom, you know, this guy here in the bottom up is probably it's only, only, only about maybe two or three years old. It just had some really good growth years. Um, so it's really variable depending on, on the, the conditions that, they, that they're in and, and whether or not they were to grow a lot. So, I mean, a lot of times surveys will actually just take lengths of muscles, but that doesn't always tell you about, about the ages, just because there is such a huge variety um, in growth in the muscles. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not steady. So for that I'll, that, I'll take any questions if you guys have. Um, more than happy to act, answer any of those. If you guys want to come out and play this summer, um, we do a muscle blitz every year. Um, basically going out the third week of August, and oftentimes it's, it's uh, centered around the search for the Higgins Eye. Um, so we're going to do that in the Cedar River this year to see if there was anything, um, if that was success successful at all, but we're also going to go down to the, into the Lower Skunk and look for Purple Warty back, and volunteers are welcome. So if you guys want to get out and play in the water and see what this is all about, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, there's experts from all over. Um, Iowa DNR, Minnesota DNR, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we just go out in big groups and we just, it's a lot of fun playing in the water. So um, if, if anyone's interested in that, um, I can get you more information on that too, or, or Kelsey 
has the information as well. So with that I'll stop sharing my screen maybe and take some questions. Thank you so much, Jen. Oh, I just saw one question come in. Um, somebody asked, are oysters only found in the ocean? What's the difference between um, mussels, both saltwater and freshwater and oysters? Yep. Um, yeah, oysters are strictly um, marine, uh, ocean-based animals. Um, all, mussels, uh, oysters, clams, they're all in the, the same, uh, um, phylum. <laughs> they're all mollusks. Um, and they're actually all in the, in the same family, I think, of, um, yeah, so basically uh, clams are, are uh, an overview, overarching term. So it's kind of like primates, like I'm a primate, and so is a gorilla, but we're not exactly the same. Um, so mussels and clams are kind of like that. All, all mussels are clams, but not all clams are mussels. And the big distinction in that is that bissel thread attachment. Um, clams do not have that. They, they just are free, free release. They, they, they don't attach to anything at any point in their life. Whereas in um, the freshwater mussels, it's only for that short period after they've dropped off the fish host. But for other species like the zebra mussel, and uh, um, the mussels you would get in a restaurant, the blue mussels from the ocean, they actually attach to um, something for the rest of their adult life. So that's the big difference. Awesome, the more you know. Um, don't see any more questions coming in, but we'll give folks a minute. Um, I thought it'd be fun if you share, you shared what um, looking for mussels looks like, but I don't know as though everyone knows the term for that. Uh, well, the, the term that they've developed here in Iowa for the being on your hands and knees and squishing around in the mud is polywogging. That's, a, that's an Iowa thing? Well, that's a, that's a, might be a muscle blitz kind of thing. I think that Scotty came up with that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's not a term I had heard before I came to Iowa. So I think that's something maybe Scotty, Scott Gritter is the guy that handles the, the muscle blitz um, came up with for the, the term of getting in there and squishing around in the mud. Great. Um, we got a question. Is the zebra mussel population going down? If so, why? And is it still harmful? Um, the zebra mussels, they tend to be very uh, cyclical. They'll have like a real big boom period and then they'll have a massive die off and then they'll, you know, rinse and repeat. So it kind of goes on. Um, unfortunately, once the zebra mussels get into a system, there's really no way to get rid of them. So the problem is that not only are, you know, do we have the populations like in the Mississippi that are going on the boom and bust, but they are spreading to other lakes here in Iowa. And uh, unlike our freshwater mussels that use a fish host to move, <laughs> the zebra mussels unfortunately use stupid humans. <laughs> so, and actually they, they found, you know, they first got interest, introduced into the Great Lakes um, on, in bilge water from, from ships that came over from um, the Black Sea in Eastern Europe. And um, then they started spreading and you can actually see, they, they did a study and they showed going west on I-80. There's like, like a timeline of the mussels are moving west on I-80 because people are taking their boats from where they're invested and they keep moving west and then they keep moving west. So yeah, they're still, they're still a threat anytime they're in, in a system. Like I said, you can't get rid of them. Um, so the, the, the best prevention is the best medicine for the, in that case. But uh, hopefully, you know, if we can get them to not spread by humans, then maybe we can get to eventually figure out a way to manage them better. Because they're not just a threat to, to our freshwater mussels, because they will attach to any hard surface. So they'll, they'll clog up intake pipes or outflow pipes, or so a lot of industries hate them as well. Um, 
And the problem with that, you know, it's like if you read the stories, like, oh, the zebra mussels came in and they cleaned up Lake Erie. And it's like, well, yeah, they came, did, but then when they have one of those massive die offs, then they're releasing all these nutrients back into the system. So it really is just a kind of a roller coaster kind of thing. It's not a, a permanent solution. And what um, what kind of things can we do to help prevent those populations, the zebra mussel populations, from booming? Or some um, yeah, it'd be basically, it, first thing we want to do is stop them from spreading. So if you have your boat in a water body where there are zebra mussels, there's going to be signs saying to rinse out your boat or you let it dry out completely, um, or you know you basically power wash it with really hot water. Um, before you put it into a water body that doesn't have the zebra mussels. That's the best, that's the best way to, to spread, to stop spread. I mean, even us, when we go do mussel surveys, if we're surveying in an area where we have, where we know there's zebra mussels, we will either completely let our equipment dry out, or if we have to go somewhere in the next couple of days, we will bleach the wetsuits, we'll soak them in bleach so that we are not carrying um, and it's usually, it's the young version of the, the zebra mussels that's the problem, um, where our freshwater mussels have glochidia with zebra mussels, they're called villagers, and they're just free floating. Um, so they can, they can survive in a very little amount of water in, in a boat, you know, drain well or something like that. So, um, and then, you know, usually um, they always do some, mus some zebra mussel cleaning on the Mississippi on some of the, the more important populations of mussels. Um, I know they've got one coming up in Cordova that's sort of been, haven't, we haven't been able to do for the last couple of years because of the COVID thing, but um, basically it's just, you know, scraping the mussels off of the, scraping the zebra mussels off of the native species um, to, to, if you're cleaning the, the mussels off basically. So yeah, I mean, if you see them attached on a live mussel, you can scrape them off and put them on dry land or I, I'm, Probably shouldn't say this, but they make a very satisfying crunch when you stomp on them once you've taken them off of the muscle. They're kind of the bad guys in, in the muscle world, you know. They, they, they should have like a little black mask and a cape and they're just super villains. If anybody needs to take anything away from today, it's, it's the, the villains of the muscle world. <laughs> um, we have another question here. What is perfect muscle habitat? When they moved the I-74 mussel population, did they find a good temporary habitat? And um, were those the Higgins eye? Um, yeah, uh, generally most mussels like a good mix of sand and gravel and rock. Um, it's just good stable. So, so not so rocky that they can't move around, <laughs> but um, enough to have be really good stable substrates. And that really varies too by, by the mussel. Some of our mussels, especially the longer lived ones, have really thick shells. Um, they, they live so long, they grow slowly, and they put their energy into building these shells. They, they, they tend to prefer the rockier habitat. And then we have other species that have very thin shells. Um, they kind of have a live fast, die young <laughs> strategy. Um, a lot of those species only live 10 to 15 years old. And they tend to prefer the softer substrates, so sand and silt or um, oftentimes they're the ones that are most common in, in rivers and lakes and impoundments as well because of that. Um, so if they're ones that like the softer substrates, generally they're kind of in pockets out of the main flow, um, just because that's not a real good stable substrate um, for them to hold on to if the flow is increased. Um, generally, although generally the, the, fit, the muscles that survive after dropping off the fish host don't leave, don't move too far from where they dropped off the fish host. So if you know where the fish like to hang out, um, I, I, was, I always liked having um, summer techs that were avid fishermen, fisher people, because they, they knew where to look for the fish. Um, so yeah, usually they want a nice stable substrate. Um, good flow refuge is, is also a good thing. So. Um, Often here in Iowa, the best place to look for mussels are, are downstream of dams, just because the dams trap a lot of the, the finer or the silt and sand that would be coming in, so you have a more stable substrate. And then also the dams act as a barrier to the fish passage. So the fish go get up there and then they're sort of like 
I don't know, we don't have, we can't go any further. So, uh, so that tends to be a good place to look for muscles. Um, as far as the I-74 um, muscle move, um, that was due to all three species of the federally endangered mussel. Um, it was mostly due to the spectacle case, though, because that was like a real good bed for the spectacle case. Um, but they, they did find all three federally endangered species um, in that area that they basically call it area of impact where they wanted to put the new bridge. Um, so those all got moved. They basically chose areas where they already had species of mussels there that they knew were good areas for mussels. And then they tried to sort of distribute them throughout that because they didn't want to just take all of the mussels they found at the bridge area and move them all to one area where there already were mussels because then that could be, you know, overpopulation, overcrowding, not enough food resources. So they tried to spread them out um, to different uh, areas where they knew they already had some good, good substrate, good habitat for the mussels that the mussels were, were doing well. Um, and uh, as far as I know, they are, are they, they just went back and, you know, did some follow up work and the ones that they moved seem to be thriving, so. That's great, that answered um, a second question about uh, any follow-up surveys have been done on the relocation. Yep. Yeah, I believe that until the, br the bridge is finished and the old bridge is demolished, they're required to go and sample every year um, to, to check on the status of the mussels. And then once that whole project is done, then it's every three years for the follow-up survey, so. Great. Looks like I've got one more question sitting in here and um, it's, can mussels be adopted and raised in aquariums? They actually do not do very well um, in, in um, aquaria for very long. Um, you know, sometimes like for the state fair, we'll have one that we have out there for, just for that, that time. Um, we are still not entirely sure of what mussels eat. So, I'll, you know, it's real hard to find a balanced diet. I actually, as part of my um, graduate work out in um, Maine, I had some mussels that I was trying to um, do experiments on and we had some in, in raceways and I probably lost about 50% of them. Um, the, when um, we're getting a little bit better with our techniques as far as like raising mussels and stuff, the fish hatchery up at Genoa in Wisconsin, it, they, they raise a lot of, of young mussels and even with that, with their aquaria, they tend to have a flow through system where they're actually bringing in Mississippi River water, just because we know that that has the nutrients that they need, rather than trying to artificially feed them algae and whatever. Um, but yeah, they're very hard to keep alive um, in captivity. Uh, and generally, you know, the ones that they're doing um, up, up, up at Genoa, they either have the adults that they're using for, for breeding you know, that they're collecting the glochidia from, and then they get returned to the river as soon as possible. And then they usually will have the young mussels that they're rearing there for a year or two until they're big enough to be released into um, their new home. Um, but yeah, and, and then that's always with the flow through, flow, flow through thing here too. So, and then as far as um, the, the mussels are actually covered under fishing reg regulations here in Iowa. And, um, you're only allowed to collect shells if you have a fishing license. And then I believe it's no more than 46 valves. So a valve is the half shell. So if you had a whole muscle, that would be considered two valves. Um, or, you know, kids under like 10 can still are, are, are exempted from that. Um, and you cannot take any live muscles from any of the inland rivers. Um, only, only Mississippi River mussels can be collected live and then again you still have to have a fishing license and there's a limit on the numbers that you have and you have to make sure that you're not taking any species that are endangered or threatened. Or, so it's a lot of regulations. Definitely. What, what purpose would people be taking them for? Um, well, I know that uh, a lot of, especially for catfish, the mussel, mussel meat makes real good bait if you let it sit and get real stinky. And oh my God, does it get stinky. 
So I know that it is collected for fish bait um, for that. And then, you know, the only other reason that it's collected in the Mississippi would be commercial harvest for the um, cultured pearl industry really is at this point. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you wanted to keep one in your, like your aquarium to keep it clean, yeah, I don't think it would last very long. Uh, I know that I've had people talk to me about like ponds and stuff, you know, could we get, could we put some mussels in there? And, you know, a lot of, a lot of the farm ponds around Iowa have mussels in them because when they got stocked with fish, they had some of those, those generalist um, glycidia on them. And, and so the mussels have, you know, this, you will find mussels in farm ponds and stuff too, so. Interesting. Never thought about that, but it certainly makes sense. Well, Jen, I think that's all the questions that we have. I don't see any more. Um, if anyone does have a question that they think of, you know, 2 a.m., they're lying awake, they need to know about mussels. Um, you can find, believe your contact information on our website um, under this forum post, or you can reach out to partners and we can get uh, you in contact. But yeah. And I did have my email at the, on the last slide of the presentation too. So uh, you can email me at 2 a.m. I'm not going to answer it at 2 a.m., but I will answer it the next morning. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you again so much, Jen. Um, I know I learned a lot and really appreciated your time and expertise. And um, I'm going to try and get out to that muscle blitz. Awesome. I'll look for you there. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And um, thank you, everyone who, who participated today. And we hope we'll see you um, in two weeks at our special forum on August 2nd. Have a great day, everyone.